Just give me a little bit of peace yeah. Steady job and some food to eat Just give me a little bit of peace yeah. Steady job and some food to eat Just give Bugsy me Siegel the first okay. Hollywood gangster, and I put that in quotes. Talk to me about Bugsy Siegel and how he made his way up the ranks to become one of the most infamous gang figures in mob history. It's funny that you said the first gangster to go Hollywood because that was actually the first thing that I was going to mention. <laughs> so Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, arguably the most legendary Jewish mobster of all time, right up there with his partner, Meyer Lansky he really was instrumental in finding or founding what is modern day organized crime and I'll get a little bit into that as I get deeper into what I'm talking about with Bugsy Siegel so Bugsy really started off as a petty thug in the, on the streets of Brooklyn he formed his first gang as a teenager extorting push carts um, and you know storefront owners in Brooklyn to pay protection money to him. Um, he would threaten them, of course, if they didn't, or maybe beat them up or whatever it may be, you know, kind of like you, what you see in the movies and stuff like that. Um, around 1918 was when he really started getting into a uh, life of crime as far as a career for Bugsy. And this is when he met his future business partner and, I guess you could say he was his friend, Meyer Lansky, who is really the Jewish godfather of organized crime. Um, and they formed what is called the, or what was called the Bugs and Meyer mob. And this is really Bugsy's first taste of the rackets. Um, they started off stealing cars and other smaller petty crimes on a larger scale. And with the, um, you know, with liquor being illegal, at, during the beginning of Prohibition, uh, they made lots of money bootlegging. And this really lasted through the 20s. Um, you know, and Meyer was the more mellow, business-minded one of the two, while Bugsy was the more ill-tempered, strong-arm type of the top of that mob. And at some point during the 20s, they really um, got in touch with, of course, the infamous... Italian mafia boss, Lucky Luciano, and he, they were both still young. They were called the Young Turks at the time. They weren't really the top dogs of New York City quite yet. There were, most importantly, um, two Italian mafia figures by the names of Salvatore Maranzano and Joe the Boss Mazzaria, who these Young Turks like Bugsy, Meyer, Lucky Luciano, they really on the low they despised him you know they they were they were called mustache peats these two guys and there were many like them they believed in old um ways of thinking about as far as organized crime goes you know they they were kind of racist they didn't believe that italians could work with other races like you know lucky was doing with his jewish buddies meyer and bugsy so they kind of on the low plotted to take these guys out and Bugsy was a key player in that, um, you know, most notably taking part in the assassination of Joe the Boss Mazzaria in 1931 in Coney Island, one of the most famous mob hits of all time. And this is really in the midst of the Castle Marese War, where we would, you know, at the end of that, we would see ourselves, um, you know, opening up to a new form of organized crime is along with the five families of New York city, uh, really establishing themselves. And as well as the national crime syndicate, which was pretty much a coalition of, um, New York and, or excuse me, Jewish and, um, Italian mobs with bugs and Meyer sitting at the top. Bugsy would also play a huge part in what is called, what was called murder Inc which was really Lucky Luciano's strong arm wing. They took, some say they took part in a you know, thousand hits. I don't know how true that really is, but it was probably somewhere around in the hundreds. Um, and some say that Bugsy took part in as many as maybe 30 of these hits. Um, and whether or not that's true, that would pave the way for his 
you know, legacy um, moving forward. And this was around 1931 when they finally took out Joe the Boss and Salvatore Maranzano. And now, you know, Bugsy and these guys like Lucky and Meyer, as I mentioned, they were kind of done with the dirty work. They were trying to get more into the business end of things. Um, and like I said before, Meyer being a little bit more business minded and Lucky Luciano kind of like that too. Bugsy found himself as more of like their lieutenant. Um, he was a little bit less bright, a lot more um, you know, like I mentioned, ill tempered and had that had more of a vicious street rep um than his partner Meyer did specifically. Um not that Lucky didn't. Lucky was widely feared. Um so fast forward a little bit, um and the National Crime Syndicate would send Bugsy out west to expand their racket enterprise where they really, um, you know, didn't have much of a stronghold. And of course, prohibition had ended. So they really set their sights on gambling as their mass earner. Um, and Bugsy would settle in Vegas, into Las Vegas, of course, which was a smaller kind of dingy gambling town when he got there. But he saw lots of potential in that um, early Las Vegas stages of what that city became known as today. Um, and he started off just involved in gambling there and many different styles of gambling, of course. And he also set up a national bookmaking ring headquartered in Las Vegas to start. Um, and, you know, after a while in Vegas, he, he really saw a lot of, of potential there. So he convinced the top mobsters on the East coast and, you know, the head of the syndicate leaders, like I said before, guys like lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, Joe Adonis, Frank Costello, um, Longies Willman in New Jersey, Newark, New Jersey. Um, those were like the main head guys of the syndicate, um, Al Capone too, in Chicago. He convinced them to start opening up casinos there while they were kind of doing the same thing in Florida and Cuba um, with their gambling operations, you know, rising up there, another new stronghold for them would be Vegas. And that's where Bugsy would put himself at the top. And he really made a name for himself. People were wondering who this very good looking and flamboyant man was mingling with the high class and fine women all around him. Uh, he took a mistress who would, become famous on her own uh, by the name of Virginia Hill. Um, that's a story for another time. Um, and he would, you know, find, or he would ask the syndicate to finance his Flamingo Casino, which was really the first major casino out there in Vegas. Um, and it's still around today. Um, and at first, uh, Bugsy came to the syndicate and he said it would be a little bit over a million dollars to set this Flamingo Casino up. And as time went on, the price tag on the casino was going up and up and he kept you know, asking for more money to the syndicate, asking for more money over the few years span. And they kind of got tired of this. They were, you know, it was really bothering them. They were like, well, you know, I thought you said it was going to be just over a few million. And now you're asking for more and more money. Like what's going on, you know, stuff like that. And long story short, it turns out by the end of the thing, by the end of the deal, um, the Flamingo is, is, you know, it costs like million multi millions of dollars to, to build and they find out that Bugsy had been skimming lots of money off the top. And that was really what the problem was there. And this really ultimately led to his demise there. Um, and on June 20th, 1947, he would be assassinated at his lavish Beverly Hills home. Um, but I, the key point to make about, um, talking or the key point to make about Bugsy Siegel when you're, you know, discussing him, I believe is that he really is called the father of Las Vegas and, you know, Las Vegas really wouldn't be what it is today without Bugsy Siegel. Mm -hmm. And apparently he found the name Bugsy disrespectful from what I understand. No one said it to his face. It was always behind his back because it was crazy as a bed bug or something from what I remember. Yeah. Reading. Yep. 
Yeah, that's that is what I've heard. I, I, you know, I think that goes with a lot of guys. Um, read the same thing about Lucky Luciano. People didn't call him Lucky to his face; they called him Charlie Lucky. And I've, I've read the same thing about a lot of other uh, gangsters of that time. And it's it's interesting. You know, they have these renowned nicknames today, but then people don't even, you know, in the time people didn't really even call them that. So that that is an interesting point. 